Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be familiar with the first half of our reading. It's the uh, very popular story in, in Sunday school. Samuel is a young boy at this point who has been born to Hannah. If you remember, Hannah was oppressed and barren, and she had come to pray before the Lord, and Eli at first had thought that she was drunk and tried to reprimand her, but then uh, he had learned that she was just praying earnestly, and he said, may the Lord bless you, and she gave birth later to Samuel. Hannah, after hearing this, had a nice little ditty she sang, and then also dedicated Samuel to work in the temple. Now Samuel would work under the direction of Eli. One day we were reading, Samuel lays in bed when he hears someone calling Samuel. And at first, of course, he thinks it's Eli calling him to a task or some such thing. Um, however, uh, and perhaps Eli, you know, if he's impatient like me, was at first just irritated to be woken up multiple times by this young boy. However, he eventually figures out, Eli does, that it's the Lord who is calling Samuel. And Eli instructs Samuel to go back, and the next time the Lord calls out to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And that's usually where the story ends, in Sunday school at least. But that's not where the story ends. It gets much more juicy and interesting, if slightly disturbing. What exactly was the message the Lord gave to Samuel? Well, it was a message of judgment. It wasn't a very comfortable message for Samuel to deliver or for Eli to receive, but there it was. Samuel uh, was reluctant, and you can understand why, to deliver this message of condemnation to the, to the man who cared for him, loved him, and provided for him. I mean, at this point, Eli was basically his boss and acting like his father, even calling him son. But God had a message for Eli, and Samuel was the man, excuse me, I mean the boy, for the job. And so Samuel had to throw the flag. Eli's sons had been given too much license, and Eli had not held them accountable. Not only his sons, but Eli and the whole house of Israel was suffering because of, his, uh, of Eli's failure. I declare, therefore, Yahweh says, to Eli that I'm about to punish his house forever. And it helps to know that he warned Eli about this uh, before this a couple times in 1 Samuel, before even sending uh, Samuel to tell him. But he says, I am about to punish this house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall never be atoned for by sacrifice or offerings forever. Well, what was it exactly that Eli's sons were doing? Well, if you want a more thorough uh, explanation, just read 1 Samuel. But the Eli's sons, like Eli, were priests who presided over the animal sacrifices. Uh, now, they were supposed to get some of the meat. The priests were. Uh, there was a procedure that they were supposed to follow, but the Lord was supposed to get the choicest, which in that time meant the fattest, portions. However, Eli's sons demanded the best parts for themselves, and so, in essence, they were taking what was supposed to be God's and enjoying it themselves and leaving God with the leftovers. Well, Eli did say something to his sons, uh, but that didn't stop him, uh, but, that, but he didn't actually stop them um, from doing something, from stealing from the people and from stealing from God, for that matter. Now, um, I know a thing or two about sons who are left unattended, and I took this picture much later. I should have thought to take it much earlier when things were much worse. Uh, but when I, and my sons got Play-Doh, but it was slime Play-Doh, which is for kids is lovely, but for parents can be a, a real nightmare. And this is what happens, right, when you leave kids unattended for too long. And I was literally like two feet away, but I was doing some sermon work, 
while watching them, so I was not watching them close enough, and you get to see some of the damage that was done, and not only when mom came home, not only were the sons in trouble, but somebody else was in trouble too. <laughs> well, she knows she was pretty, but I've been, she was, she was nice, but I've been outlawed from allowing them to play with that when she's not there. <laughs> so, but that's right, that, that does kind of happen. I mean, that's a little extreme, um, but left unattended without supervision, things can go haywire pretty quickly. That's how it often, often works with sin as well. If we don't correct sins and snuff them out early, then the fire grows bigger and bigger until it's a raging wildfire or you have Play-Doh slime all over your clothes, which is a lot harder to get out than you'd think. Um, God's judgment will come. It, it can come in a couple of ways. It can come when God calls his people to repent and then they turn towards him in repentance. They feel that judgment. We hear the law and we repent. But if God's people don't accept the rebuke, then judgment comes anyway, and this time it comes in the form of punishment and consequences. In this case, it meant that Eli and his sons would die, and that all of Israel would suffer when the Ark of the Covenant would be captured by the Philistines. God's judgment comes. God's judgment comes either in sorrow over sin, or it comes in sorrow after sin. Um, but God would certainly not abandon or forget his people, despite the punishments that he would send to them. In fact, this boy, Samuel, who would deliver this uncomfortable message to Eli, would continue to deliver messages, sometimes comforting and sometimes uncomfortable, to the people of Israel. Now, fortunately for Samuel... For all of his faults, Eli still feared the Lord. He didn't take any vengeance or retribution on Samuel for delivering this message. And he didn't try to stop God either. Um, interestingly, when Samuel delivered this, this message, he didn't do it from a, a position of strength, but rather from a position of vulnerability. I think that's uh, sort of demonstrative of how God often does things. And if you look at history, and there's plenty of history in, even within the scriptures to illustrate this, God's message, it seems like it's often more effective when God is delivering a message not from a position of strength, but of, from a position of humility and weakness. You know, take Moses uh, speaking to Pharaoh, uh, or Elijah speaking to King Ahab, or Nathan speaking to King David, and each of these cases, the prophets were not in a position of strength, uh, but, un, but were facing off much more powerful men, kings. The apostles in the New Testament testifying while incarcerated before the Sanhedrin. Or the greatest example of all, of course, Jesus bearing witness to the world at his own crucifixion. You see, God does not need military force or clout for his kingdom to come. If he wants it to come, it will come, often despite the forces that are at play in this world. Uh, the primary way that God accomplishes his mission is through his word, and we see most clearly in the New Testament through Christ crucified. Uh, this story gives us some very important lessons. Part of the message of the people and the prophets of God, sometimes the message that has to be delivered is a message of judgment. And I think Peter in the New Testament gives us some really helpful words. He reiterates this and clarifies this uh, story in his first letter. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Uh, this is the clear example, I think, of, of both the Old and the New Testament, that God is most concerned with correcting his own people. Sometimes God brings judgment on the surrounding nations. He certainly does that. But you know who receives by far, far and away, the most correction in the Old Testament is Israel, God's people. The scriptures devote way more time and energy to God and judgment or correction upon his people than he does the outside world. And I think that's 
uh, important for us to take to heart. The problem is, though, right, it's natural for human beings to focus on judgment <laughs> for others, not on, on judgment for us. It's easier for us to condemn others than it is to admit our own sins. And it's important, uh, this sermon as we're talking about Samuel and he's setting boundaries, it is important for us as Christians, as, as Christian families and congregations, uh, in, to establish boundaries. You need boundaries everywhere in the world. Every business, organization, country, everybody has boundaries. Um, but unfortunately, it, it at least seems to many of us that it's harder than ever to degree, agree on where exactly the boundaries should lie or where we should establish them these days. And what makes that even more complicated is, of course, like I said, no one, none of us, likes to be told that we're out of bounds. Um, as we, there's, I'm, if you're a football fan nowadays, practically every time a flag is thrown, you can expect the offending player to throw up his hands like, what do you mean? What did I do? Maybe sometimes they didn't, but the vast majority of time, they did. But rarely do they just say, yep, yep, my bad. Usually they try to create some doubt of some, and that's like all the rest of us, right? Um, it's, um, but it's important. It's important for us to establish some boundaries. It's clear in the scriptures that Christians, individuals, churches must have boundaries of some sort. And certainly, we should not condone evil in this world. And sometimes we've got to say something about, I'm not saying we never say something. Uh, sometimes we do need to say, hey, uh, that's out of bounds. However, it's pretty easy and natural for us to get things out of whack. Sometimes it's a lot easier, like I said, to talk to others than it is to uh, consider how God's word affects us. It's easier to attack the outside world and take pot shots at the sins of others than it is to admit our own faults. But it's, um, uh, it's uh, like Jesus said uh, and demonstrated throughout his ministry, um, first take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of your brother's eye. Judgment begins with the house of God, which is why when Jesus comes, he clears the temple, right? It's literally there. It's the house of God, and that's where God's judgment begins. It's also why you, why we, the church, are the most important focus when it comes to judgment. And we know. We probably won't always like what God has to say to us. God's wordy word has plenty of correction for, for all of us. But we, you and me, we need God's laws and boundaries in our lives, even if it's a, a, a bit uncomfortable at times. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Pointer was here, and he gave a very pastoral pointer. He said, clean your own room before trying to clean up the whole world. Um, one such example is Paul's reminder to us today that even our, our very own bodies are not just our own. Rather, we have been redeemed, we, and our bodies are rightfully the Lord's. We've got uh, our plates full trying to be pure in a world that is infatuated with impurity and sin. And, you know, in, in this particular case, it's a good case. We do need to speak the truth by uh, sharing uh, the truth, this truth with the world, but I think more of our energy needs to be poured into fixing our own lives rather than gleefully pointing out the flaws of others. The reason we have boundaries, uh, the reason we call the church to account and point out sins is certainly not to humiliate or to denigrate. The point is to be ready to hear the gospel because we always want to remember that whenever God takes something away or it feels like God is taking something away, he's promising he's going to give us something better. Whenever you feel like God is really taking something out of your life, that's when it's time to be excited because you know somewhere, some way, God is going to give you something much better. Now, it may not be exactly what you expect, it may be completely unexpected. It may not be in the timing you want, but God, that's just how God operates. 
He's not trying to rob us. He's trying to give us good things. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's why we have to have judgment and share the law, not because we particularly enjoy it, uh, but because we need it to prepare ourselves for the good news, for the gospel that Jesus is bringing. Repent and believe the good news, Jesus says. That's what he preached. To the, we've been reading in Mark, in both Bible study and in our gospel lessons, the kingdom of God is coming. It's, not, it's coming not in the Romans or in the plans of the Pharisees. Rather, it comes in the person and the message of Jesus. Later in the book of Acts, God's kingdom comes through His church. It comes through the gospel and the preaching of the gospel that we're all saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, the crucified one. Judgment did come with the house of God, which is why Jesus um, cleared the, the temple and condemned the temple. Um, and God's, as I said earlier, God's judgment comes in, in one of two ways. It comes either in sorrow over sin when we repent, which prepares us for the gospel, or if we don't take heed, it comes in sorrow after sin. But we know which option God wants us to take, which option He prepares us for, which option He gives us the Holy Spirit so that we might have sorrow over our sin, so that sorrow doesn't come after our sin. And we know this because Jesus made uh, the incredible claim as he, judgment begins with the house of God, and we see that in a whole new way in Jesus, because Jesus, after all, made the claim, I am the temple. Jesus is the house of God, because the house of God is where God is present with his people, and that's where Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. He's God present, Emmanuel, with us. But Jesus came, and he received voluntarily the judgment of God. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Judgment began with the house of God, but Jesus and humanity along with Israel would have been condemned, but Jesus stepped in. Israel failed, Christians fail, you and I fail, but Jesus does not fail. Jesus was faithful, and He will do what He has promised no matter what no matter what is going on around us. And He has promised. What is it He's promised and that He will do? He's promised to forgive us, to fix us, to save us. Not because of our good deeds, but because of His great love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.